TDA trade show and conference. It's a pleasure to be here with you guys today. It's an honor uh, that NATDA would ask me to come and do these training uh, courses. Um, we want to shout out a, a special thank you to Link Trailer Parts that is sponsoring this entire series uh, of training uh, classes this morning. And then, of course, our, our title sponsors for each individual class, B&W Trailer Hitches, will sponsor our first class with the B&W uh, Turnover Ball Gooseneck Hitch Installation and Fifth Wheel Hitch Installation. And then Kurt will cover, uh, will sponsor our installation of the tow package on the Subaru you see behind me. And then Dexter is going to give us a great class on trailer axle and bearing maintenance. Uh, I think uh, brake, brake, brake maintenance, I think. But um, so a special shout out and a thank you to those sponsors as well. And they're the ones that made all of this possible and, and helped out uh, with hotel rooms and all those sorts of things. So we certainly, certainly thank, thank them for doing that. All right, so let's dive in and get started. Um, I've got a lot of, of, of material to cover. Some of you may want to take notes on some of this. Um, one of the things that's going to be kind of a challenge is there's such a diverse group of people in the audience. Some of you guys may be familiar with this stuff because you've been doing it for 20, 30 years or more. Some of you guys may be brand new to it. So reaching an audience that has all these different levels of experience, some of this stuff is going to roll right off and, and you're like, well, yeah, of course. Just remember other people are probably newer to the industry and need a little bit some of the basics, but we're going to try to cover as much as we can. All right, and then, of course, I already said that uh, uh, Link is covering this, and then I've got uh, uh, a great relationship with B&W. I don't actually work for the company. Um, I actually consult with them, and they bring me in to do uh, presentation pro uh, projects and stuff, so that's one of the reasons why they chose me to be here. And let's dive right in. So um, you'll notice that the title of the course was professional gooseneck hitch and fifth wheel hitch sales and installation. So we're going to cover both the sales and the installation aspects of this particular uh, product. Um, the first, we may not even have a whole lot of time to do some installation stuff. How many of you in the audience are techs? Okay, good. It's about 20%. Um, I'll try to get into as much of the installation as we can, but we already know that we're going to be pressed for time. So I'll get some of that done. If you end up with questions, this guy had a great question right at the very beginning um, about a, a good way to drill safety chain holes where they, where they line up. If we got that kind of stuff, we don't have time in the class, just track me down, I'll be here the entire, uh, the entire duration of the show. But what we want to talk about is the whole idea of being a professional. And part of being an industry professional is being responsible. So we've got to take some responsibility when we do this. What are the responsibilities of, of an o now, OTA stands for over the axle. So what are the responsibilities of an over-the-axle towing equipment dealer and installer? You don't have to write these down right now. These are the five main points that we're going to cover this morning. Um, this is the five main points, and then we'll go through, and I'll address each one individually. We need to know what the customer is doing. That's, that's first and foremost. You need to help the customer determine if they are within their limits. You share a little bit of that responsibility. Um, some people don't know what they're doing, and it's you're on the front lines of that to make sure that they're not... Uh, they're, they're not, they're not, that they're not getting towing equipment that's not enough for what their needs are. Uh, help the customer determine the appropriate equipment for their needs and expectations. We'll cover the difference between needs and expectations. And then offer and perform professional, high-quality installation that focuses on safety and longevity. If you really want to set yourself apart as a, as a professional and be able to, to gain the respect and loyalty of customers, you've got to offer more than just a low price. Low price is usually not the best thing in this particular industry. Case in point, we've got a $70,000 HD Denali here, and then the guy's pulling probably about a seventy dollars or $80,000 trailer, and someone's going to squabble over $200 on the thing that holds all that together. It doesn't make any sense. Um, you can actually capitalize on this particular aspect of, of bringing those two pieces together by emphasizing the safety aspects, the quality aspects, the difference in different installation methods and techniques. Showcase that. People will pay attention and listen. We'll get into that a little bit later. Educate customers and end users on the proper use and maintenance of the equipment that they have purchased. This is a big one. Um, and I'll get into it in more detail later, but uh, that's, that's a real big one. We'll cover it. All right. So the first thing is to know what the customer is doing. And how do you do that? You ask good questions. Now, keep in mind... 
um, some customers are a little bit more private than others. Um, they don't want to. Uh, they don't want to disclose a lot of what they're doing, and that's fine. We don't want to get into you know the nitty gritty details of things, but the whole idea is to get them to understand you're far less concerned about what they're towing and how much weight they're towing. So the idea is to get them into a place where they realize, okay, this guy doesn't really care about what I'm towing, but he needs to know how heavy this 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 rig is going to be. So, what are you pulling, and how heavy is it? Um, is a good question to ask. Um, find out if they ever intend or plan on hauling anything heavier than what they have now. Help them plan ahead. Sometimes this towing equipment can, can be anywhere between $1,000 to $3,000 by the time it's all said and done. And if they've got an intention of doing something with it later, you want to make sure that they're, they're, they're able to do those things as well. Um, some users are going to haul all kinds of loads. They're not going to have a direct answer to that question, um, but, such as commercial carriers. They might, be caught, they might be hauling 10,000 pounds on this load and 30,000 pounds on the next. So be aware of that. The idea is just to get them thinking about what they'll, you know, that they're set up for anything that they'll ever pull. Okay, does your trailer attach to the truck with a ball and socket connection or a kingpin and jaw connection? That's a very important question to ask because most people in this industry, especially if they're new to towing, don't even know the simple difference between a gooseneck and a fifth wheel. And some of you may be in situations before where someone says, I need a fifth wheel hitch installed in my truck or a gooseneck hitch installed in my truck. You set up, you do the appointment, get it all installed, and you're, then, then you find out that that's not what they wanted. They actually wanted the other item. So the terminology can be kind of confusing. Just say ball and socket or kingpin and jaw. And then that way, if they don't know that, then, then they all, obviously all of a sudden realize they need to know that. But that will answer that question uh, for you. Um, what is the cabin, uh, the cabin bed configuration of your truck and how's the nose of your trailer built in shape? This is going to be helpful so that you can begin to understand whether or not you're going to need to be thinking about a slider um, or anything that's going to be a short bed consideration so they don't contact the back glass of the cab. Um, just because a truck is a short bed does not mean you need to automatically move into a slider. There are some measurements that can be done. Uh, to make sure that they're in the right towing equipment before just opting for the extra expense in a slider. Um, I can get into that later if any of you have questions about that, but it's a good idea to find out if it's a short bed, long bed, four-door cab. Uh, Ram has, a, has the mega cab. That can be a serious issue on some trailers. Find out if the trailer is squared off, has the, the covered part over the nose, if that's squared off or if it's rounded. Newer trailers are got, uh, have clipped corners, and they're a lot more friendly for the short bed trucks. So just some things like that to pay attention to. Help the customer determine if they're within their limits. And um, this can get kind of complicated, so I'm going to kind of try to cruise over this best I can. But try to get the truck's gross vehicle weight rating, uh, which is in the, it's in the, the door jam there on the, on the sticker. Gross combined vehicle weight rating should be in the customer's owner's manual. If it's not in the, it's usually not on the door tag, but that'll, that'll say what this vehicle can handle gross, both the vehicle and the trailer. Um, and then get the gross rear axle weight rating, and that is inside the sticker. I don't know if the camera guys aren't quite ready yet, but I want to make sure that I'm telling you right. Yes, right here on the data label, you got gross axle weight rating for the rear. On this particular truck is 7,050 pounds. The reason why you need that gross rear axle weight rating is so that you can take what the actual weight of the back of the truck is and the tongue weight of the trailer to see whether or not you're not overgrossing the rear axle. So, and that's right there on that on that data tag. Get the trailer's gross vehicle weight rating and tongue weight. Tongue weight. Uh, tongue weight specifications on trailers are almost always estimated. Okay. So when a manufacturer says the tongue weight of our trailer, especially fifth wheel trailers, not so much goosenecks, but fifth wheel trailers almost industry wide, they'll, they'll give you a dry pin weight or a pin weight on the trailer on the specs. And it's not, I've seen those be off as much as 10 to 15, sometimes even as much as 20%. So if you really want to be safe and you want to be really absolutely sure, the best way to get your tongue weight measurement on a trailer is to use a scale, scale it. And there are some different ways to do that. But real world data, instead of what they're telling you, the tongue of a trailer works, real world data is always accurate. So if, you, if you've got the means, use a scale or have the customer use a scale. And you can do that 
by the way, on the BMW website, we've got this, uh, this nice little worksheet that you can do. This is on our website under resources. And it's a little worksheet where you can take the gross vehicle weight rating, the gross combined weight ratings, all the information that I just told you needed to get. And if the customer will take the truck to a, a, a CAT certified scale, um, they can put the truck on the scale and get the weight points of the truck together, the truck by itself with the tongue on it, the trailer by itself. You don't actually have to pull it up on the scale, kind of like what's in the picture, because usually they're in three different segments. They're actually very easy to use. And scaling a truck usually only costs about nine to 10 bucks, $12. Um, at most of these scales, but if you want to be absolutely sure and you want your customer to feel good about what they're doing, it's always a good idea to tell them to, to visit the scale. Now, this is to get nitty-gritty. You should be able to tell whether or not they're going to be within the limits of the product by answering some general questions. If you want to see just how close they're pushing the envelope, this is a great way uh, to do that. Also, too, right now, this is in just printout format where you do the worksheet by hand. In about a month, this resource should be available to you where you can actually go on the website and just man just enter the data right in the screen and it spits out the answers so you don't have to do the math so kind of cool um, online resources um, is anyone here familiar with the trailer life website has anyone ever used that okay you need to you need to write this website down it's www.trailerlife.com if you go to that website and select towing guides you'll find that they put out a guide to towing every single year. Excellent information. It will take, up, I think, almost 900 vehicles and gives you all the information verified with the manufacturers what the actual capabilities are of those individual vehicles. Um, I mean, it, not just trucks. I mean, SUVs, passenger cars, the whole nine yards. Um, an example of that, I know, I know that you guys can't see that probably from where you're at, but over here on this side, my little dot's not working, but over here on the left side, they give you little notes and stuff uh, that you'll see, you'll see footnotes on the chart that corresponds, corresponds with your footnotes over here on the left, and that's to take into consideration things like two-wheel drive versus four-wheel drive, gear ratios, um, all kinds of data. So once you, once you know what you need to know about your vehicle, you plug it into the chart, and bam, it tells you, hey, this vehicle can tow 8,000 pounds and it'll tell you exactly what you need to know. So that's a very great resource, uh, trailerlife.com. Um, and then of course, get pictures of the vehicle and trailer data tags if you can. If you're talking with the customer on the phone, they don't know what they're doing, you, you, you sense that they need some help. If in today's day and age, a lot of people like just take a picture with their smartphone and then text it or email it, just have them take a picture of the data tag inside the, the truck door jam and the, and the tag that they got on their trailer and have them text that to you. Bam, you got your, you got your gross vehicle weight ratings, you got everything you need to know about that particular combination. So have them send those pictures. Okay, now we wanna talk about uh, helping the customer determine the appropriate equipment for the needs and expectations. Needs, by the way, are non-negotiable. Once you find out what the customer setup is, a need is a need. You, you, we need to make sure that this particular issue is addressed. Expectations are more along the lines of what a customer wants or what their desires are. For instance, um, on the needs, some things you need to be aware of is, is nowadays, does a truck have a puck system uh, or other OE integrated equipment? Because if they got a puck system already in the truck, this one did not, you'll find that the GMC out front, the nice one that you passed by on the way to the registration table, it does. That's a game changer. They got an integrated puck system, you're gonna have to go with a, with a fifth wheel hitch that fits those pucks. Um, integrated brake controller would tell you that you're not gonna have to do a brake control, et cetera, et cetera. What is the cabin bed configuration? We already talked about that. And then are there any aftermarket accessories that may add limitation? Something to be aware of. Some of these guys have got bed rails. They stick up you know, out of their bed rails and come up this high, that's gonna affect your clearance between the top of the bed and the overhang of the trailer. So bed rails, uh, toolboxes, liquid transfer tanks, uh, maybe they got a suspension or a body lift on the vehicle that's gonna raise it up and it's gonna cause ride problems with the trailer. So be sure and ask about aftermarket equipment. Um, next is uh, expectations. Ask the customer, do you want the bed to be completely flat and free when the hitch is not in use? That's gonna tell you if you need to be under the bed or over the bed. Do you prefer a custom or a universal installation? Custom installations are cleaner, less, less aggressive to the truck, whereas an after, uh, uh, universal installation is gonna require a lot more fabrication, drilling of holes, that sort of thing. Let them make that decision. 
uh, you want the ability to pull both types of over the axle trailers. In this particular instance with the BMW setup, with the TOB and the uh, Companion, it's a great setup to be able to, to get the customer set up so they can pull both styles of trailers. And then of course, how important is ease of use and maintenance? Some products require a lot more maintenance than others, some less. Uh, those, are, those are some things that you'll need to understand so you know how to steer them in the right direction. And guys, by the way, what you're trying to do is, is to, when you're asking them these questions, if, if, you're the, if, if you're the type of shop, I've been to some of these shops before, it's had, had me come and, and help them out. If you're the type of shop that answers the phone and someone says, hey, I need to get a gooseneck hitch put in my truck, how much are they? Oh, we can put those in for $600 installed. Okay, thanks very much, and off they go. They're just going to call around and shop. And basically what they're going to end up doing is they're just going to end up buying it. They're just going to go to the place that's the cheapest. If you answer the phone and start asking them questions like this, the customer is automatically going to understand, wait a minute, I'm not getting these other places asking me these questions. This person must know what they're talking about. No one else is asking me about, about my trailer's weight, my tongue weight. They're not asking me about, you know, what, what do I want and how am I going to do these things. So... They, be, they begin to trust you immediately because, okay, this person knows what they're talking about. You, you immediately start to build trust. And even if you end up being hundreds of dollars more on your installation costs, they'll still go with you because they feel safe and secure. That's the customer you want. Um, and that's what we're going to do. We're going to offer, we're going to offer and perform professional high quality installation that focuses on safety and longevity. And one of the ways that we do that, um, first of all, I'm going to give some information of some, some poor uh, installation examples. Um, I launched a video on YouTube about four years ago, which is what actually put me in the position that I'm in. I got sick and tired of talking to people that would call me on the phone and telling them, hey, they'd always complain. You're, you're $150 higher than the guy down the road. You're $200 higher than the guy down the road. And I would say, well, let me tell you what the guys down the road are doing. They're leaving bolts out. They're, they're, mess they're, they're, they're tearing up your exhaust hangers. They're doing this. They're doing that. And and it was, I sounded like a broken record. So one day I got to a job where I was taking a gooseneck hitch out of a truck and I was reinstalling it into a, the, next year, the next year model newer. And every single thing that I usually tell people about was actually exemplified on that truck. And I was like, this is ridiculous. I can't even believe this thing's in this truck. So I got out my phone and I started filming it. And I'm hardware that was missing because the bolt was hard to get to over the fuel tank. Let's you know, not put it in there. Um, the safety chain loops were, the, the, the lock nuts were ran all the way up. I'll get into that in a little bit. Sometimes you can't get your hooks in those. The fasteners were not torqued properly. Fasteners were reversed. Long fasteners were used where there, where there were supposed to be short ones. Short ones were used where there were supposed to be long ones. Um, there's, there's a place in here we'll get on this truck where you cut a notch in the bed so you can slide the rails through. Instead of taking the time to cut that notch, someone just took a crowbar in there and just, just jammed it up and put this crease, now you couldn't see it in this truck because it was covered with a bed liner, but it did put an inverted dent in the bottom of the truck. Just on and on I could go, it's craziness. And when people begin to understand that you are, you are embracing a good quality installation that's not gonna give them any problems for as long as they own the truck, they're gonna go with you, period. At least the customers that you want. Some customers are all about money, and you, as well as I know, that's great sometimes, but sometimes those can be your worst customers. <laughs> um, so anyways, uh, some of the things that you can do to ensure a good quality installation is obviously don't cut corners. I know that sometimes the service department's running behind, we gotta hurry and hustle, we're falling behind, but do not sacrifice quality for time. Stay with it, don't cut corners. Uh, don't, don't leave a bolt out, don't not torque the fasteners. Take the time to do it right. Not only does your company's reputation, uh, not only is that on the line, but the safety of the, of the customer and everybody else on the road is on the line. So take the time to do a good quality installation. It's very important. Um, measure twice, cut once. Can't overemphasize that enough. And it's not just BMW, it's just about every brand. You better make sure that that tech has got those measurements right. I can't tell you how many times I've gotten calls, hey, we got our, our hole in the bed, we're going up with our center section and we're off by about a quarter of an inch. What do we do? Did you keep your chip? Because <laughs> the only real good way to fix that is to weld the chip back in at a body shop, have it all refinished and then remeasure and cut again. Unless you're okay with taking a Dremel tool, 
some type of rotophile and making the hole fit, but then when you get the hitch in there, you're going to have this funky crescent moon shaped thing around the, it just it doesn't look good at all. And most customers aren't going to stand for that. So measure five times <laughs> and cut once. But, uh, and I've even got a method to kind of keep your text out of trouble on that here and we'll, we'll get into. Follow the procedures that are out, outlined in the instructions, especially when it comes time to tightening sequences. At BMW, we filled a lot of calls, people saying, hey, this thing's not, the hole's not lining up, it's not fitting right. Most of that's because they're trying to skip ahead and they're not actually following the tightening or the bolt placement sequence. The engineers have got this thing figured out, guys, to where certain, certain bolts and certain holes go in in a certain order and it'll make the hitch fall into place as you tighten it because there are things called dimensional instability from one truck to another. The bed on this truck is not going to be exactly placed forward and aft and side to side as it is on the very next truck that you're going to do. And that's one of the reasons why sometimes the timing can be, can be off from truck to truck. Uh, you know, this one took uh, two and a half hours, this other one took three, what's the deal? There's dimensional instability sometimes that you're working on, or that you're working around actually. Always torque fasteners or specifications. Always, 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 always. Over-tightened fasteners, by the way, can be just as dangerous as under-tightened ones. If you got a tech that gets, uh, gets uh, impact happy, guys, some of these things are crazy. I don't know if you know about it, but we, we like to use cordless, cordless impacts uh, in our line of work because back where I'm from in Northwest Arkansas because we're a mobile operation. We go around and do all of our installations right on location. So we use cordless impacts. This Milwaukee is capable of 700 foot-pounds tightening torque and 1,100 pounds nut-busting torque to remove nuts. 700 pounds is way too much torque. And if you've got a, a tech that gets impact happy and he's running those up to what he thinks is the correct torque or tightness, you could have bolts that are severely over-tightened and an over-tightened fastener is just as dangerous as an under-tightened one. Because you get into a collision, over-tightened fasteners can break like glass. So very important to follow the torque specifications. All right, um, and then this kind of goes without saying, but go the extra mile. Nah, I think we're good. Go the extra mile. Exceed your customer's expectations every time. Now, I, you, you've heard, a, you've heard a, a thing that's been said before, you know, hey, uh, over, or under, under promise and over deliver. I don't really like that. Don't under promise. Just, just do a good job. Do a good job and exceed their expectations. Um, just, just do a good quality job and I promise you, your customers will be happy about that and they'll come back every single time. All right, some challenges with estimating installation time. Um, any service riders in here? Couple? Have you been frustrated before about time? <laughs> This is an industry topic that's been debated pretty heavily at times. It's probably the main reason behind the huge price spread from one dealership to another. Um, but what you need to understand is, uh, well, let's just get into it. First of all, shops can be very different, okay? Different practices and protocols. Some, sh some shops run a tighter ship. Some, some shops don't care. Um, so that, that right there could already be an hour, hour and a half difference between one shop and another different tools and equipment. I am going to outline some of these things with common everyday household tools just to show that it can be done. But if a person's got a rotophile, a Dremel tool, good, good, good quality power equipment, these installations can be sped up quite a bit. If a person's going to use hand tools on the, enti in the, on the entirety of the job, it's going to take a little longer. Um, different installers and different methods. Some guys have got different methods, modes of operation. I've, I've seen there's, you know, 100 different ways to skin a cat. You know, some guys want to want to step their drill, their, their pilot bits up in like five or six increments before they get to the final hole size. Other guys like to try to punch all the way through with a half inch bit right off the bat. So there's, there's just different things that are going to affect that installation time from shop to shop. Then you also have trucks that can be very different. Uh, original equipment and aftermarket equipment has to be worked around, um, such as plastic bed liners, uh, fender well liners that have to be custom trimmed, that sort of thing vehicle options. Um, some of these vehicles have fuel control valves or fuel control modules are sitting right on top of the, t of the fuel tank that are going to have to be temporarily moved out of, out of the way to be able to get the rails in the center section and everything positioned and then you, you reinstall that equipment. So I, I've literally had the same make and model of truck in the shop 
two days in a row and I had a 30 to 45 minute difference in installation time just because of a couple of little vehicle option differences. So, uh, and then of course, moderate to excessive damage. Every now and then, I don't know if I got that up there yet. No, nope, I do. Moderate to excessive damage. Um, I had a guy show up one time, he'd been using the back of his truck for hauling firewood. And they'd been throwing firewood in and out of his truck so much that the, the bed looked like a roller coaster between the, uh, between the bed hat channels, the supports. Well, if that bed is sagged down between there, that's going to affect the, the vertical placement of the hitch and the holes aren't going to line up the frame. So now you find yourself under there doing body work, you know, to straighten the bed back out so that the hitch will fit correctly. That's going to affect time. The reason why I'm telling you all this is for you service riders that get frustrated with this whole thing, realize that you've got the power to get your customer to thinking about this, this may not be a set price. Let them know that, hey, uh, we do this by the hour. Um, it's, it's a time issue. Um, if some of you want to use a flat rate, that's fine, but I've found that hourly installations work really well and they're profitable because you can tell the customer, hey, just to let you know, there are a lot of different things that we get into on these trucks. Some can have fender wheel liners, some have bed liners, some things require trimming. There's temporary component removal and reinstallation. I can tell you that the installation usually is going to run between two hours and three hours for your particular make two and a half to three and a half for your particular make, get them to thinking about that range and then that covers you and your tech to fall within that. It's a, it's a great way to get them to understand. And don't, I mean, if, if, you, if you tell them that it's gonna be between say two and a half and three and a half hours and it ends up taking three hours, charge them for three hours. Let them, you know, don't just always charge the highest side because if they see that you're, you're charging for what, you're, for what the time really was spent, you just earned a, you just earned a repeat customer. All right. Turnover ball, gooseneck hitch, installation overview. Doing pretty good on time. I was hoping to be here right at the 30 minute mark. Um, this is where we're gonna kind of start to get a little technical um, on our install. Now, as you can tell, the truck that I've got here for you techs, uh, we'll cover this here as quick as we can. Some of you guys in the, in the office might gain a, a, bit, a little bit more appreciation for what your techs are doing here. Um, this is where we're gonna actually get into the installation procedure of a BMW turnover ball and the companion setup. This truck has already been through some of the installation process. You can't do a three and a half hour installation in a, in a one and a half hour time slot. It's just not gonna happen. So, what is it? What is it? Oh, I'm, I'm fired, yeah. I'm just gonna do it. You're out of here, get it done faster. So what we've done is we've got the equipment installed in the truck and I've got the hitch partially removed. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna catch you up to where we're at, okay? How, how did we get to where we're at right here in front of us? So, um, now in this particular truck, um, I took the time to, uh, to remove the fender wheel liners. You don't have to do this. You can just take the two bottom screws out of the fender wheel liner and actually put like a, a pry bar or a piece of two by four or something there and pry that fender liner up to expose the area between the bed and the frame. Uh, to slide the rails through, but I will caution you, some guys are very picky about their trucks. And if you crease that fender wheel liner, some guys don't like that. I know it's a fender wheel liner, but some people are more particular than others. And it didn't take me a whole lot more time to take the fender wheel liner out than it did to monkey around with the thing and hold things in there and, and work around it. People are picky. This guy here that let us use this truck, you would have thought that I was taking his first and only born daughter out on a date uh, to bring his truck up here to Indianapolis, but um, he was very happy to participate in the program because he got all this equipment installed in his truck for free, so that worked pretty good for him. But the eight and a half hour drive here, the whole time I'm thinking, I went around this truck and there's not a blemish on it. So some people are, are pretty particular and you need to keep that in mind. And then the next thing, Again, something doesn't have to be done, but after you get the spare wheel and tire down, they've got this spare wheel and tire heat shield that's between the spare tire and the exhaust. You can get the center section up and around that on the Chevys, but I find it's so much easier to take the thing down. It's two bolts, 13 millimeter bolts, pull the thing out of there with a ratchet, get it out of the way, it gives you a lot more access to the underside of the bed there. It only takes two minutes to take the thing down. Next thing is the heat shield. Um, one of the things that some of you techs may notice is once the, the Chevy GM product went to this newer body style, we don't have to cut the heat shield anymore. It's a removal process. So instead of taking your cutoff wheel um, or your air shears and cutting off a, a section of the heat shield between the bed hat channels, there are four fasteners. 
um, to or under, on the underside of the truck or can be accessed from the underside of the truck forward and aft. And then the last two fasteners are accessed through the fender wheel right there. See how easier that is to get to with the fender wheel liner out of the way? If the fender wheel liner was in there and I had it propped up, it's going to be hard to get my tools, my ratchets, and everything in there. I'm also showing that you can use ratchets, power ratchets, ratchet wrenches, whatever's going to be able to get you in there and get the fasteners out uh, as conveniently as possible. Then once you get the four fasteners out, just remove the heat shield and discard it. The hitch is going to become the actual heat shield from the, from the uh, uh, tailpipe to the bed. And then, uh, man, we're doing great on time. I love this. Okay, so what we're going to do is I'm going to show you this process. Some of you are going to think this is crazy, but this just shows you how, how dedicated I am to precision and quality. A lot of guys are going to measure the hole that they need in the bed and just drill it out, and, and they'll, they'll get their point, mark, mark the center punch area. You can see me here. I'm getting my forward and aft measurement, which differs from truck to truck, so be sure to follow the installation instructions. And then I line it up side to side, put my center punch hole in, and then what I'm going to do is drill a very small, I think that's a one-eighth drill bit, and I'm going to recheck it. I'm going to recheck it. I'm not going to just drill a quarter-inch hole and then go straight to my, my hole saw. And here's the reason why. Those pilot bits can, can walk, even when you don't think they're walking. And if a pilot bit walks just as little, I'm not kidding, it's 330 seconds, a sixteenth of an inch. By the time you get your hole saw in there and that thing takes that little bit into consideration at the at the, the center of your hole, that could be as much as an eighth of an inch off on the outside of the hole. And now all of a sudden when you go to put your, your center section up, it, it just doesn't look right. You don't want this crazy looking gap in there and you don't want the bed, the sheet metal of the bed to be pushed up or pressed against the, uh, the center section collar when you're tightening it down. And what I'll do is I'll actually double check to make sure that my hole is staying centered as I step up until I get all the way to the quarter inch drill bit and that way I know that, that hole is exactly where it needs to be and when it comes time to do my four inch hole um, you'll see me take care of the tail filings here in a minute we'll put that center section up into place and it is a perfect fit with that perfect symmetrical gap or air gap all the way around the hole it just looks wonderful when you're done I'm using a magnet to get rid of my tail filings I find that that's an easy way to do that uh, in these spray and bed liners because they're hard to, to blow out. And you don't have to use a hand file to, t to take care of the, the tail filings. We do have a rotor broach, or a, not a rotor broach, you got me stuck on rotor broaches. Uh, you can use a rotor file or a Dremel tool to clean that up. And then I take the extra time to go ahead and mask that out on this particular type of truck um, and prime and paint that edge inside that hole so that we don't have to worry about long term rust takes a little bit of extra time to do it but like I said you take the extra time to do a good quality uh, installation your customers will pay for that because they know you're taking care of them especially for longevity reasons so nice neat and clean um, if you got a truck that uh, doesn't have a spray and bed liner and it's black or white you can use you don't have to mask it off you can you can spray from the underside and you don't have to take the time to mask it off but on, a, on the Denali I wanted to take the extra time to do that um, there was something else I was going to say about the hole in the middle but I can't remember what it was. All right, um, and then remember me talking about the uh, pry bar tool earlier where the guy just stuck it in there and s smashed the bed up. Some guys will take the time to take four bolts on one side of the bed loose and actually lift the bed up on one side to slide the rails through. To me, it, I mean, it, it takes just as much time to do that as it does this method. Uh, what we do on this particular truck is we want to put a V-notch uh, in the uh, bed lip right here and we want that to be two inches wide and what I'm doing see those punch those punch weld marks right well what I do I backed it up didn't I let me see your your laser Jim Jim's works better than mine it must be a Dexter thing well it's not there it is there it was see that little punch weld mark right there and right there we're going to center that up between those two so that the pinch welds remain intact. And you want, a, you want a two inch spread. So what I do is I hold the ruler up there two inch, put me a mark at the, at the one inch mark right there in the center. Then mark out uh, one, two inches, uh, one inch to either side of that mark. That mark in the center is supposed to be three quarter inches tall or, or just to where the lips come together there. Just like so. And then you can get in there with air shears, cut off wheel. Uh, reciprocating saw, whatever tool they, they they use. I like to use a cutoff wheel. It gives me a good clean cut. Take the time to file those tail filings off. 
Uh, you don't want somebody to be that's working on the truck later on to cut their fingers and stuff up on it. It's prime and paint. That little V-notch there looks great. Um, it's ready to receive the side bars of, or the, the bars of the hitch. And it's hidden by the, the, uh, the fender wheel liner. You put the fender wheel liner back in, it covers it up. You can't, can't even tell that you did anything. Okay, now we're going to go. Uh, so we got the truck basically prepped at this point to get everything put in the truck. We got the hole cut, the notch cut, all the heat shields and everything down. This is our front rail that we're going to install. And um, it's going to slide in. Now you're going to see why we put the notch in the bed. Right there, it slides in from left to right, or from right to left, actually. Then once you get it in a certain way, get underneath, pull it the rest of the way in. And you'll notice that on this particular truck, see that bolt right there? We're going to put that one bolt in. We're going to take this little rubber O-ring and put it onto that bolt to help hold that bolt into place. And the reason why we do that is that particular fastener location is right over the top of the fuel tank. It's a little difficult to get some guys that got big hands and big arms and they can't get in there to hold that bolt into place for later in the installation. So we put that little that little rubber O-ring on there to hold that bolt where it needs to be. Slide that thing up there and it'll hold it right into place for you later. And that's the bolt that I've actually seen guys leave out. They actually omit the bolt. That's obviously a big no-no. Center section, pretty simple. Um, just uh, raise the thing up with the driver's side on the left, the passenger side on the right, watch the hoses and everything on the left. And you'll notice that we put the center section up after the front rail Tex will call us on this particular truck saying, I can't get center section in, there's not enough room. First question is, did you go ahead and put your rear rail in after the first rail? Yes, I did. Take your rear rail out. The installation instructions are very clear. On this particular truck, you put the front rail in, then stage the center section, then put in the rear rail. If you put in the rear rail before you stage the center section, that rear rail takes up just enough space that it's very difficult, if not impossible, to get the center section up into place. And then the rear rail, um, has to be oriented a certain direction on this particular truck. You'll notice there's a divot in the center of the frame, and I'm marking that across. Those holes need to be oriented towards the bottom of the bar. I placed a nice little mark on there to let me know which side's up so I don't lose my orientation. It's a good idea to run your fasteners in and out of the threaded holes in the bar just to clean out any paint and some things that might be in there. It's easier to deal with fasteners that won't run in and out of the bar outside the truck than it is to deal with that once you get up under there. So take the time to make sure your fasteners are running in and out of that bar now instead of trying to do it while you're underneath. I'm going to slide the bar into position, knowing that when I rotate it, um, which sometimes it helps to get, I'm showing the up there, sometimes it helps to grab your big crescent wrench and pop that thing up into place like so, pull it back. Now we're ready to go up with the center section, and I'm going to show how that works with the, with the hitch helper here shortly. Now, before I get underneath the truck, I'm going to start on that here in just a sec. Before I get underneath the truck, a lot of you might be saying, why in the world they got this thing up on little stands here? We took a survey a few years ago and asked everybody, how many of you guys are doing installs on the ground? And I couldn't believe the overwhelming majority raised, raised their hands. We're doing installs on the ground. Okay, well, if that's the way that most of you guys are doing it, then that's the way we'll do it here. I'm okay with a lift. We used a lift for years. But, as some of you guys know, the in and out of the bed on this truck is so much that you're constantly going up and down and up and down and up and down with the lift. Some guys get ladders and they climb up ladders and get in and out of the truck so they don't have to move the truck on the lift. It's almost just as easy, if not easier, to put the, the truck at a fixed height and let the tech be the person that goes up and down. It's, it's, it's just simpler in my, in, my, in my estimation. Also, too, when you're under the truck, either on your back on a creeper or sitting on your rear end, it's a lot easier to hold components into place than it is to be standing on the floor and going into bench press mode, trying to hold everything up with minimal contact with the ground overhead. So this is actually a little simpler. Some guys don't even jack the truck up. They'll get under there and do installations with the wheels on the ground. There are some advantages to getting it up, though, because if you jack the truck up just high enough to let the rear axle hang, you'll notice that the, the rear axle's hung just enough that it's not touching the ground. That's going to give you the maximum spread between the underside of the bed and the top of the, of the, of the transfer case. So it creates some space in there. Also, too, the fender wheel liner screws that you saw me taking out earlier when the when this axle sags, you can actually get the, the, the lower three on this side and the lower two on this side out without having to use flexes and all that sort of stuff. Your tool will fit in there. Um, and then uh, you'll be able to get the torque wrench in the fender wheel a lot easier with the with the axle hanging as well. So just some, some pros to that particular thing. Okay, I think at this point, I'm getting ready to get my hands dirty. Yep. Oh. 
Okay. Um, I'm just going to leave that up on the screen, and we'll get started with where we're at. Okay. I'm going to try to push through some of this. We're ready to rock. Um, I want to show you guys how to use this hitch helper because some some shops, for the longest time, I actually had an apparatus I made myself. It was a it was a two by four with a boat winch in the center of it. And what I did is I had it padded on both sides where you had a piece of foam pad taped to it that would sit on the bed rails and go across the top and you had a little uh, boat crank in the middle with a cable that would go down you grab the center section and pull it up. Problem is the board stuck out over the truck about this far. And one day I wasn't paying attention. I'm under here doing everything that I'm doing. I stood right up underneath that thing laid me cold out. I literally was out. So some of these apparatuses that we come up with in the shop can be safety hazards. Um, the b and Hitch Helper is an awesome little tool. If you've got an overhead lifting device, cherry picker, a little uh, crane operation in your, in your shop, that's fine. Use those things. But this little guy is awesome to have around if you're doing multiple installations, and it's very easy to use. Now, the Hitch Helper itself, you can see that I got the little, the little uh, tab down in the bed. I'm going to turn that sideways like so. And then he's underneath there. I want to get under here with him. And what we're going to do, I'm situated underneath here where I need to be. And I don't know if you can see. Are we on? All right, here's our, uh, here's our hitch helper tab laying down here, and here's the center section. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick that up enough that it's on top of that, uh, on top of the, the collar there. And I'm going to slide this back to where that drops down. There we go, into the, into the, uh, the center section socket. And then I'm going to release the driver's side handle. Don't have your finger up, in, up inside here. You'll smash it. I'll let that through. I'm going to feel with my finger to make sure that we're, I'm not quite, quite in here. Hang on a second. See, this is the part of that, li that live stuff I was talking about. There we go. I don't know if you can see that or not. Okay, so now we're engaged. It's pretty simple. Lock it in there. Go ahead and position this about where it needs to be centered underneath the hole, like so. You don't have to worry about it falling. Toss that creeper back underneath the car so you don't slip and fall when you get out. An old guy like me has to climb up in the truck instead of doing it in one leap and bound here. And then lift this up. Be sure that your hanger's right in the center of the latch pin, like so. Thread the knob down. And if he's filming under there, you can see that this is going to draw that uh, center section right up into place in the hitch. You should see that gap closing as I crank the knob down. And you don't have to get this thing he-man tight, just you want good firm pressure to the underside of the bed. And there we are, nice and snug. Uh, the newer hitch helpers actually have a knob on there before we had a, a, a bolt that we had to turn. So now our center section is held up underneath the truck. It may not be square at this point, that's okay. We'll square that up later. And the next step is to go ahead and attach the front and rear cross members to the center section. And I don't know if you can see that bolt up in here, uh, the one that we put in with the O-ring earlier. I'm going to reach around the frame here. Can you see that with the camera? Right there, see that bolt above that fuel tank? See it? Okay, right in there. And I'm gonna, you got it? I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull this rail back a little bit, maybe you can see it easier. So I'm gonna line that up with that hole right there. You see it coming through? And then I'm gonna pinch it like so. And that gives me that that gives me that that bolt hole, or that bolt lined up with that hole right there, and I don't I didn't have to reach in back behind this this uh, fuel tank to hold it into place. Now you can go ahead and get a lock washer. I'm going to just have to get down on the ground here. You can go ahead and get a lock washer and washer on that to hold it into place. So get that up there. Get that on. Just like so. 
Okay, and then the other hardware is pretty simple. Let me grab those. Bear with me. I got this stuff laid out under here, but my wife offered to be a, a, a lovely assistant for me today, but I told her she needed to take the day off. Okay, and then you're going to see these bolts come through like so. So, and so these, the, 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 this, now guys, remember, this is for this GMC pickup truck. Other models will be laid out a little differently, but for this particular truck, the hole in the front rail and the center section is both circular. It's not oval. So this particular model will just be the bolt without any type of flat washer or anything through the front. And then just a lock washer. I know my arm's probably in the way. A lock washer and a nut on each one of those fasteners. Let me put that in here. Very good. And the next one. Get my hand underneath these hoses. Oops, sorry. Didn't mean to give you a bump. Did you guys see everything okay? Fantastic. Okay, so the front rail is up. You can snug these up by hand. They don't have to be tight at this point. In fact, you don't want them to be tight. Just finger tight is all you're after. Right there. And that'll hold the front rail and the center section together. Now, your rear rail is the one that has the threaded holes in it. Slide that forward up against the, uh, the center section. And you'll have longer, longer fasteners for this uh, so that they thread all the way through that one inch thick bar. And you'll line these up with the holes on the, on the front side. You're probably not going to be able to see that with the camera because we're on the wrong side of the, of the uh, plate here. But let me line the, the holes up. And then you just feel for that hole in the bar and then thread your, your fastener in by hand. By the way, every now and then, you may have, uh, every now and then you may have um, a bar that's not quite lining up with these holes, and that's probably because you have too much tension on, uh, on the center section against the, the floor of the bed. Um, if that's the case, just release some of the tension on your uh, on your knob up there and let the let it sag just enough to get the, to get it started. I got that one started right there. It's a little stiff, but it's going in by hand, and I know it's started without cross threading. And then repeat the same thing for the other. Oh, sorry, I am not used to having a camera under here with me. Uh, did that make everybody fall out of the bleachers? Hopefully not. started. They say that I lost my sound here. Check, check. You hear me now? All right. And okay. And then the last two, same thing. Find that hole up in here and get it started by hand. In the interest of saving time, I'm trying to stay on this side of the differential. Sometimes to start these forward holes, it's easier to put your creeper on the forward side of the diff and see what you're doing, because I'm going completely by feel on this side. Okay, and there we go. All four of those are started. Now, at this point, like I said, hand, hand tight. You can go through here and just finger tight all these fasteners. These back here, you can run up until the lock washer just makes contact with these four, but leave this loose for now. In fact, some people prefer to leave a little bit of a gap between the rear and front rails, and I'll show you why, because the next step is outside the truck. <laughs> That's pretty much the hardest part, is working around that diff. I actually went to a shop one time that, that would undo the leaf springs on certain models of trucks and let the rear end of the truck sag 
even further to work under there. And I'm like, that seems awfully extreme, but some guys will do that. Okay, then the next step of the installation is the side plates. And you'll notice that I've already put these side plates. Is this the side you want to do? We can do this side or that side. It doesn't matter to me. What I'm going to do is put these uh, side plates up and show this area. We can do it on that side or this side. It's up to you. Go to the other side? Okay. I've got this fifth wheel here, so be careful. All right. I'm going up with the side plates. Um, I need a time check real quick. What time is it? Okay, 8 till. So I'll talk a, bit, a little bit something about the undercoating on these frames. GM and Chevy, notorious for dipping their frames in this undercoating. They give us a very thick coating sometimes. Some guys will put these side plates right up there and not even mess with the undercoating, but I will tell you from experience when I've taken fifth wheel or gooseneck hitches off in these types of applications, the fasteners are not as tight as they were when you first did the installation. And the reason why is over time that, that undercoating, that thick layer wants to ooze and goose out. I actually will hold the side plate up and line my holes up with the holes in the frame and line that out with a pencil to see where my footprint is at. And I will take the time to scrape that undercoating off in that area. I know some of you guys up north like, oh, we'd never take undercoating off the frame. But let me tell you, a good solid metal to metal contact with nothing in between will give you a good solid torque specification that will hold for a lot longer period of time. And if you're concerned about rust because of road chemicals and salts and stuff, you can take a can of just regular spray undercoating and it'll go around the edge of that and you're done. But I'm telling you, it does make a, a difference when you have that thick coating um, on these frames. The other ones that are painted, not an issue. I, personally, I like the thick undercoating that GM puts on their trucks, but it is awfully messy to work, to work with. So some of your techs will want to use gloves. Okay, now these two holes in the new uh, 2016 and 17 trucks are actually threaded. You don't have to put the little bolt guides anymore. So we'll hold this, this plate up into position. One of the reasons why I say leave the rear rail and the front rail loose in the truck is so that you can get the ears of this plate right here between the two rails. If you go ahead and tighten the, the, out, the, the rear rail and the front rail together with the center section, you may be closing this gap up enough that you can't get the ears of the side plate up between those two rails. So leave them loose, get that wedged up in here between those two rails, put the plate on the frame, start your fasteners, leave these loose. Don't tighten these down yet. And the reason why, if you go ahead and snug these down, you may have whole alignment problems right here. Um, you need to be able to see how much that plate moves up and down there. And you need, sometimes you need that little extra help. Now on this particular one, we're going to put standard bolt through the front of the rail back. We have a standard circular hole in the back, so I don't need a flat washer there. Here you have the oval hole, the slot. That definitely needs a, a, lot, a flat washer. Always use flat washers or serrated uh, conical washers on slotted holes. And then there's your lock washer and nut. Snug that down. And then the back one is a threaded hole inside that plate. And you can find it there. Okay. It's kind of dark in there. I can't see what I'm doing. But. Okay, thanks, Jesse. And I can't see very well. Okay, in this particular case, I've got an alignment issue that I think is being caused by the, the center, the hinge helper being a little tight. But before I go up there and loosen that, where is my, there we go. You guys have seen these before. It's a little alignment tool. Very handy to have. Be careful with this because you can damage the, the, sh the uh, threads inside the bar. But you can line that bar up with that and then pry that into position a little bit just in case it's a some type of anomaly in there that's holding you up. And then I'm going to take a second stab at it. And 
just not have enough light in here to see what I'm doing. Yeah, there's someone got a nice little pin line. Thank you. Pull this back that way. You see, this is one of those fun things that always, what I'm going to do is I'm loosening the two bolts on the side plate to allow this to tilt up a little bit. And see there? Well, I drop it. See? That's what I'm saying. These live shots are always so fun. And then your, your tech comes up and he cussing the hitch and all kinds of other fun stuff. There we go. Okay, I feel it started right there. There we go. Another part of it's me trying to go fast. Okay, now it's threaded right in. Now we can tighten these down and that'll draw that hitch into position. That's why they want you to follow that that tightening sequence. I had these a little snug to the frame, just loosen those up, pry the, pry the plate out, and it lets that line up. Now, at that point, the hitch is actually in the truck. And all we have to do at this point is follow the correct tightening sequences. Thank you for the light, sir. Um, follow the correct tightening sequences, which will be outlined in the installation instructions. There's always a tightening sequence. At this, in this one, I'm going to go by memory here. You tighten the front rail and the rear rail to the center section. Once that's tight and you've got a good mold between the center section and those two cross members, then you square the hitch. And that's the time to square it. And the way you do that, I don't know if i got my little ruler out. I don't think I do, but point this out real quick. The way you do that is you measure. I like to use a little, a little metal ruler, but you measure. Now, once we tighten, see this gap right here between the, uh, the rear rail and the front, the ear right there, that gap? That gap will not be there. It'll be tight. And then what you do is you measure from the back edge of the rear rail to a fixed spot on this, on this uh, bed cross member. And you measure what you have here, go to the other side and make it match. And what you can do is take a, a, a pry bar or something and move the thing left and right because it will pivot in the truck slightly. And once that's the same measurement on, on both sides, then you know that you're square with the bed. Once you're square with the bed, then they want you to tighten the side plates to the frame, which are the two big bolts that go through the frame, tighten those, then tighten the two remaining fasteners on the ears. After everything's tight, then torque. And I will, quick word about torque wrenches. Guys, the little cheapies at Harbor Freight will get the job done. They're fine. Just replace them often. I think it's about a $30 torque wrench. Gets the job done. Replace it every year. Um, instead of paying to have it calibrated, but it works really well, um, and it's short. Some techs don't like a shorter wrench because they can't get as much leverage on it, but you can actually get about a quarter to three-eighths of a turn in there around all that crowded stuff with the fuel, the fuel tank and the differential and all those sorts of things. It's easier to use this wrench. Longer wrenches give you more leverage and are easier to tighten down, but you may only get about an eighth of a turn at a time. So something to keep in mind with torque wrenches. Then once that's torqued down, your gooseneck hitch is in place. And you can take the, now we're still loose. I'm not obviously gonna take the time to do all the tightening. But uh, you can take your hitch helper loose. Just thread that out enough that you know that the, that the rod will come out. Go ahead and do that. Disengage the handle from underneath. Now you don't have to do it. And then with the, hand, with the latch pin released, you can take the hitch helper out of the vehicle, and there's your finished product. Now, in the interest of time, I'm not going to do the actual safety chain loops and stuff, but I will address it because it's a class that we, or a question we had right before the class began. What's the best way to put your safety chain loops in? A lot of guys get frustrated with this because they end up with, with a marred surface up in the bed. If you don't have a spray and bed liner, it'll show it. Spray and bed liners are awesome to work with, by the way. I love it when a truck has a spray and liner. But um, if you're drilling your hole from the underside, straight half inch right through the, right through the center section, when it pierces through the bed, it, it curls the sheet metal up and leaves a, a lip, which you're either going to have to take the time to, to file, clean up. Sometimes they don't align quite correctly with the hole because the installer may not be holding the drill at a right angle with the, with the work. The best way to do this those holes that are drilled, or laser cut actually, into the center section 
are actually just a hair bigger than half inch. So if you get a 17 30 seconds drill bit and take a 17 30 seconds drill bit and, and drill from the underside as straight as you can, don't drill through the metal, just drill enough that you put a divot in the sheet metal, change your 17 30 seconds out to an eighth inch, let that small eighth inch bit line up with the divot that you've created in the metal, pop it through. Now you have a nice eighth inch hole on the top of the bed and you can enlarge that out to a quarter and then half or you can use a step bit there and step it out but that gives you a nice clean aligned hole from the top of the bed that's you're not going to have to spend hardly any time dressing it at all um, I've had guys ask me too how do I dress those holes to make sure they don't rust you can put prime and paint inside those a little harder to spray paint those particular holes I have found something that works really good to seal that off so you don't have to worry about rusting now this is very important on the Fords with the new aluminum bed. You're going to have to treat these surfaces. You can't just leave them exposed or they will corrode. And what I've found is liquid electric tape. Is anyone familiar with that? Comes a little, little, uh, little thing with a dauber brush in it. You can take that and actually coat that inside that. It cures up pretty fast. And I've noticed on trucks that I put it on, it lasts for years. It'll, it'll just adhere to that raw metal and keep that sealed shut for you. So that works pretty good. I've heard of people using clear fingernail polish and all kinds of other stuff, but anything you can do to keep the rusting down that area would be good. All right, a uh, quick word about, now that's how you get the gooseneck hitch in. You guys are, okay, great, we're doing good. Once you get the gooseneck hitch in, you can do over, overhaul, uh, over the axle towing with the gooseneck hitch. Simply place the ball down in the socket, release the latch mechanism in the driver's side fender well. Um, you can store the ball in, this, in the system when it's not being used as a plug and it keeps the bed flat. The companion is a great system. Um, you just take the, the top head, the coupler head off of the base. This will make the overall fifth wheel hitch easier to manage. Um, and then what you can do is make sure that you're, you like to break loose the, uh, the draw down bolt. And then the entire base comes right out of the out of the gooseneck hitch. This base isn't that heavy. Um, I know there's a big a big dilemma going on right now about weight, aluminum versus steel, and those sorts of things. I got all kinds of uh, information to give you on that. You can come and see me at the booth later, and I'll give you all kinds of information. I would stick with steel. It's just my own personal opinion. Slide the base down into the fifth wheel. Hit the release latch. Tighten your drawdown bolt to the specified torque and then put your coupler back on. You're ready to tow a fifth wheel. Um, customers really like the BMW setups for many reasons, but one is the fact that it's solid, it's durable, it's American made, lifetime warranty, excellent customer service, on and on the list goes. It's one of my favorite brands, if not my favorite. So that's how you can go back and forth between gooseneck and fifth wheel using the turnover ball setup. Now, real quick, does anybody know what this is? Rail installations. I want to touch, touch on this briefly. Rail installations are on top of the bed. Some customers don't like it because it's going to limit them from sliding plywood, two by fours, things like that in the bed. However, it is a cheaper way to go. If you're going to do a rail mounted installation, the one thing that you need to let your techs know and techs that are in here, use the U bolt or use the little U shaped spacer blocks. Uh, I don't know why I'm, my brain's not working right now, but probably all that heavy lifting under there. But what you got is the rail will go in the bed. I don't know if you guys can see the details of that, but, but this rail goes in the bed from side to side in the truck. This one's cut in half. And once you determine which hole alignment's right for your truck, you utilize a series of L brackets for universal installations or custom side plates for custom installations that are specifically laser cut to meet to match the holes on the specific truck you're working on. Personally, that's my favorite way to go. Some guys will opt for the cheaper way. You go with these guys, notice these, these bed corrugations. If you put the rail in there and just drill your holes and put the, the bolt through there and tighten it down, it's going to crush those. It's going to crush them flat. Customers don't like that. And not only that, but it also puts the rails under undue stress and strain because there's unneeded tension in those areas where, the, where they're trying to cr crush together. So you're supposed to use these U blocks, like so, to fill in the gap 
between those bed corrugations, like so. And if this hole, if this square hole happens to be here on the truck, then the block will be on the top side of the bed. If this hole is on this side, then you have to put it under, on the underside of the bed between the bed and the bracket. It's very important to put those in there. I have photographs of what can happen to vehicles when those U-bolts are not, in, or those U-spacers are not put in there in the event of a collision. It's not pretty. Very important piece of equipment. Be sure your techs are using them. Put it right between, uh, be between the, wherever it needs to be for the bed corrugation. The reason why it's slotted like that, where it's open on one end, is just in case it ends up, if the hole ends up, if the bolt ends up being right in that transitionary period, uh, section right there, it's okay. Just butt it up to it as flat as you can, and it'll go in there and, and do its job. So be sure to use the U-spacers. U -spacers. All right, let me see where we're at here. Uh, I guess real quick, putting the electrical plug in the bed. You can see how I've got my, my pilot hole already in there and I use an actual mounting bracket. Did you see me line that hole up? I may have went a little too fast. If, I wanted, if you want to play it again, I can. But the main thing before you cut your hole in the side of the bed for an electrical plug is to be sure that you've got enough space for the hole before you cut it. Because nowadays, I, don't, I, don't, I can't pause that, but nowadays, just because the fender well is right there where you see it does not mean that that's where that's at on the back side of the frame. Any, any techs out there have been in this situation before, you know that you could have as much as two to three inches further in from the bed of fender well on the other side of that wall panel. So you take it for granted that you got space back there, you drill, drill the hole and realize that you're right up against the inner fender well liner or sometimes even in it. So what I usually do is I'll, I'll pick out a spot that I want to use for it, drill a very small pilot hole that I know will be within the range of my hole, and then reach up in there from the back side and feel to make sure you've got a good solid inch, inch and a half of space, probably inch and a half of space all the way around your pilot bit. As long as you're good, then go ahead and step it out, put the plug in. Uh, personally, I like, uh, Kurt's got a great harness for these particular trucks. 56070 is the part number. Plugs into the factory wiring right here on the back of the bumper. No muss, no fuss. I do take the time to do dielectric grease, seal the plugs up, run the wires, tie it all up with zippy ties, make it look nice and neat. All right, now, big one. Educate customers and end users on the proper use and maintenance of the equipment that they just purchased. Guys, there used to be a time, we're almost done. Um, this is a huge problem in the industry today, okay? There used to be a time when a, when a customer could go to an actual trailer hit shop buy towing equipment, and after it was installed, the, 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 the technician, how are you, sir? It's good to see you, all the way from Bend, Oregon. Um, there would be a time that the installer or the shop owner would go outside and visit with the customer and show them how everything worked. That doesn't happen anymore. Most places are trailer dealerships, U-Haul, Camping World, RV dealerships, truck accessory outfits, which may be some of you in this room. And the deal is, most shops nowadays install the towing equipment Customer comes up to the counter, they pay their bill, they hand them the key of the vehicle and send them on their way. And the customer may not have a single clue as to what they're doing. And that's one of the reasons why trailer-related incidents on our nation's highways are continuing to climb. Because people just, more and more people are getting turned on to the idea of towing, especially recreational towing, and they don't know what they're doing. I can show you all kinds of videos that blow your mind, but uh, we're not going to take time to do that now. True professionals in this industry are kind of a dying breed. I've been doing this since I was 14 years old. I've watched what's happened in the industry over that course of time. And guys like myself that just focus on towing equipment, we're, we're further, and for, further and fewer between. So I'm trying to help bring some of that back and impart some good quality information and techniques to, to a new generation of technicians so that this type of professionalism can live on. The end user, by the way, is probably the most important person to do an orientation with. Because if you got a guy that owns a business and he's got guys that work for him, construction, whatever, he's not going to pass the information on to his worker. He's just not going to do it. So sometimes it's a good idea to get a hold of the end user for these tips. Give a proper and thorough orientation. You got to do it. Orient them on the use of the product. Go over proper use, how to, how to flip the ball, how to make the lever go in, how to take the, the companion in and out, go over proper maintenance, what to lube, how often to lube it, Know these things and go over it with them. 
Ask them if they have any questions. And if they do, be willing to go over everything with them as many times as you need to to make sure that they feel safe and secure and that they know what they're doing. Okay, I tell people all the time, listen, do not leave here unless you're comfortable. I want to know that you know what you're doing and that you're good with it. Don't take someone's mechanical aptitude for granted. Some people know a lot and they don't need this. I still do it anyway. Once I've done my spiel, you're good, I'm good, let's go on. Other guys, I've had them, I've had them actually show me how to take the thing in and out three times before they had it. But at least they've got it. And I don't have to worry about my customers having issues on the road. And with question and answers, we'll open that up to you guys. We don't have a lot of time. Got 10 minutes for question and answer. If we go over, don't worry, I will be here in a Connected, connect, uh, connected Correctly booth on the trade show, trade show floor. I think it's booth, what's my booth number, Jesse? 1035? That's my hotel room. I don't know, I'm out there somewhere. <laughs> so anyways, I'm out there in the middle of the floor. You can come, I'll be here all weekend long. You wanna chew on my ear, talk about technical things, that is my wheelhouse. I love to get into those types of discussions. So chat me up and we'll, 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 we'll chew the cud. Yeah, questions. Now, I know I wasn't that thorough, but some of you guys have got to have some questions. All right, we've got our first one right there. We're going to bring a mic to you. If I don't trip. We want everybody to hear your lovely voice. See if you've been paying attention. It'll be a test at the end. What are you using for a hole saw? Uh, I think the new, it's the new Dodges. My guys are smoking through hole saws. Yes, in they are. Three beds. Yes, they are. Uh, I'm glad you brought that up. As I've got a myriad of them here to show you real quick. BMW sells a Starrett. Excellent hole saw. I would highly recommend it. I think BMW sells them at cost. Chad Ayers, I don't know if he's in here. Where's Chad? There he is. We're selling these. At, we're selling these at BMW, right? Like 35, 40 bucks, something like that. Yeah, if it's, if it's not 35 or 40 and it's more than that, just tell them that Chris said you can get it for $35. <laughs> yeah, show special. Chad, try to keep that from Beth if you can. Okay, so that's the Starrett hole saw. I'm a, very, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of that, but not everybody sells a Starrett. I like it because the, the, the arbor is integrated with the saw. Some of you like the, uh, because that's a dedicated four inch hole saw. Some of you guys will like the change out uh, saws. This is the, uh, the Linux 4-inch, and the arbor just pops down. You roll the, uh, the hole saw off, the arbor, it's got little holes in there, and the Linux seems to cut really well. You can use that same arbor for both the hole saw for the hole in the bed and also your wiring hole uh, in the bed. You can just switch, switch the cups out. However, I just came across a new hole saw about three weeks ago made by a company called Diablo. Does anyone use any of these? You using the Diablo? These are awesome. Check this, check this arbor out. That's simple. And you take the other hole saw, just pop them on. I'm done. Ready to cut. No twisting, no pulling. So far, you can see I've only used this probably what, two times? <laughs> so I don't know about overall cutting length. How long have you been using yours? Where'd you go? Uh, three months. How, what? About three months. Three months? Cutting good still? Yes, yeah, very good. So I'm I'm Kind of a fan with that. Another real quick tip about hole saw maintenance, let the saw do the work, okay? Especially when you're going through the, the bed corrugations right here, let the saw do the work, don't force it. You'll, you'll, you'll chew all kinds of stuff up. Just let, it, let the saw do what it needs to do. Use some cutting fluid on there if you need to. I like to run the saw backwards when I first saw, just for about five or six revolutions to kind of establish a cutting groove so I don't have to worry about the thing jumping out as I'm actually cutting the material. Great question. Anybody else? Yeah, right here. Manufacturers are putting dimples in the beds. Are they the location where you drill? No. Thank you. <laughs> Do not let your tor your techs think that that little divot that's in the bed provided by these manufacturers, that that's the spot. No, 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 no. Measure from the back edge of the truck bed or whatever hitch that you're putting in. Be sure you're following the measurements outlined in their instructions to make sure. People come in and say, I don't understand. I'm and the RAM is a good, a good, uh, a good, uh, uh, example of that because the hole you cut in the bed is actually not, it's, it's somewhat out of the flat spot where the, you think the ball would be and it's actually on into the bed corrugations a little bit. You get called back, oh, are you sure that this is where they're supposed to be? Follow the measurement. Be sure you're doing it for your truck now. Be sure that you're do, using the measurements for a short bed versus a long bed. 
and four wheel drive, two wheel drive, whatever the whatever the the criteria is, be sure you're following that. But once you've checked it and you double checked it, the measurements that are in the instructions trump any type of dimples you'd find in the bed. Thank you, Key. Anybody else? Right back here. I, I, okay, the question is, what do you do when the ball gets rusted in the hole? First of all, if you'll follow the maintenance out, the maintenance uh, in the installation instructions, you'll never have that happen. Okay, now, I know that's kind of a loaded deal, but let me explain something to you. Where'd that ball go? A lot of guys will take the, the turnover ball, and they think that they need to slather this thing up with lubricant. No. They'll, 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 put, they'll put lubricant on the flat parts of this ball. That's not where the ball's making contact in the socket. The ball is only making contact in the socket on the curved clipped corners. The square is only there to keep the ball from turning inside the socket. So when you, when you layer this up with dirt with grease, what's happening is that grease is just attracting road grime, dirt, and dust in, inside the socket. The whole reason why we do it that way is so that when you drop your ball in and it slams shut, the dirt and debris and stuff that's in the hole is allowed to fall out the bottom. So if you slather that all up with lube, you're actually accumulating debris in there, and it will cause a long-term seizure if, if the ball is left in one place for an extended period of time. If you just lube the outside corners with lithium grease and take the ball out of the bed and drop it back in once a month, once every two or three months, you won't have a seizure. It won't happen. Now, I have had guys play practical jokes. I had a guy one time come like, can't get my ball out of the socket. I don't know what's going on. I talked him through. One of the procedures that you can do, if it is seized, you can take a rubber mallet underneath the truck and be sure that the release handle's off, and you can, you can wrap the ball from all different directions, try to break it loose that way. If the ball is in the up position, great. Just hook a trailer up to it, uh, crank the jacks of the trailer up, and, see if, and just lift the truck off the ground usually. And if you jump on the, on the bumper, it'll usually pop out. But if it's in here like that, a lot harder to work with. Um, wrap on the ball. Um, I've seen people take a block of wood, try to hit it out that way. There's ways to do it. There's only one time I had to take one all the way out because it was so seized. Got the thing out, out on, the, on the shop floor, it's seized in there, can't get it out. Took a 20 pound sledge and a block of wood and hammered on that thing for about five minutes. It finally broke loose and came out. Somebody played a practical joke on their boss the day they quit work and they put Loctite in there. <laughs> yeah, that was not fun to break loose. So anyways, there are ways to do that, but if you, I'm telling you, if you keep white lithium grease, a very thin coat on those four corners, take the ball in and out every so often, it won't, it won't seize. Anything else? How are we doing on time, Jesse? Any other? What is it? Okay. Last chance for a question here in this forum? Cool. Well, guys, that's that particular class. Um, I don't know where my clicker went, but I'm supposed to put it up, so I got the next the next uh, slide, but feel free to take a quick intermission. Thank you. Take a quick intermission. And uh, get yourself some water, use the restroom. We'll start back up here in about 15 minutes on the next course. Thank you for your time. You bet. Dealers, there is a concession stand open right outside the doors if you want to grab some coffee or some snacks. We'll see you back in 10 minutes. Thank you.